Welcome to the second day of the 2012 Activity Conference. Our first presenter today is Judith Varga. Clap. Please give her your special attention as she is one of the very few female presenters in the history of Activity. Um, I think she shows a very close fitting topic, which is a girl's role in nerd subculture. I guess we all know the nerds, I would hope we know the girls too, so she will examine the relationship between the two of these. This is Judith Varga, or the geek girl's case with the tiara. Okay, so welcome everybody here. Uh, I'm really glad that you uh, came so many because it's a really early hour, so I really ap appreciate it. Um, today I will talk about geek girls and their role in, uh, well, our subculture. And this is the table of contents, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, we will try to clear up the definitions, because there's quite a mix-up uh, in geek, nerd, and uh, hipster words. And then I will talk about geek history. Uh, for the past years, I've engaged myself in geek studies, so mostly I um, try to get a deeper insight into the history of geekdom, mainly boy geeks, but uh, for the past year, I, uh, well, sacrificed most of my time to girls in this subculture. Uh, the, my third point will be how the geek girl was born, and uh, then I will introduce you the most common stereotypes and, uh, how, uh, and their relationship to the, the reality. And the fifth point is uh, the most important for those who uh, either work uh, at a university or at a company and have a uh, female co-workers or uh, students. Mm, this is called the leaky pipeline phenomenon. And uh, well, at the finish, I will um, try to show you how you can uh, solve the problem that this phenomenon causes. <coughs> okay, so let's start with the definitions. As we see geeks today, they, uh, geeks, nerds, and hipsters today, they are mostly the same to us, as you can see on the right side of the slide. But traditionally, geek was someone who is unfashionable, socially inept, knowledgeable, obsessive, and enthusiast. From this, I would like to underline the word enthusiast because that's the core of geekdom. This word was born in the 19th century when uh, a writer in a children's book wrote it. Um, and um, back then, it didn't really mean anything related to technology. Nerd, as, a, as an opposite, is uh, uh, deeply related to technology and, uh, well, sciences in uh, general. It is uh, someone who lacks social skills and who is boring, boringly studious. Uh, this word was born in the 1950s, uh, mostly when co-educated uh, schools were uh, founded. And, uh, you know, a nerd is someone who wears a checkered skirt, uh, very high pants, and who is well, kind of the loser of the school. Most films from this time uh, present nerds in a very, well, unpleasant way, but uh, it, it has changed throughout the years. And hipster is a very trendy word today. Uh, it practically means someone who follows the latest trends and fashions. Hipster word was born in the 1940s, and uh, it meant jazz musicians who wanted to um, be more hip than anyone else. On this slide, I've uh, gathered some words from my interviews, because I uh, carry out interviews with geek girls and uh, sometimes geek boys as well. And, um, well, uh, these are the words they say most often when I ask them what, uh, how would they define the word geek. Well, geek means uh, enthusiasm, uh, which I have mentioned before, and uh, someone who is in search of answers. Geeks are really creative and uh, they want to figure out how things work. Um, geeks want to build something or make something and most of all solve the problems. So when I uh, talk about geek girls, I mean anyone who is uh, deeply interested in someone, enthusiast about it and uh, well, I had to broaden the subject to women in science in general. And um, yeah, now I, I will and talk a little bit about geek history. Uh, geeks were, as <laughs> I've already mentioned before, the losers of the school. And um, they were the ones who, after school, uh, were building, creating something, always. Um, and um, they, they could invent things. 
Well, if you have the, the talent and the creativity to build and invent something, why not make money out of it? Uh, I don't think I have to mention the names, but uh, just think about Bill Gates or Wozniak or anyone who has made money out of being able to uh, create not only a company, but a product. But because a product is much more important than just building a company. And um, Geek has, um, um, throughout the years, become a genderless thing. Because um, in the first time, it, uh, Geek and Nerd were only used for boys. But uh, as more and more girls realized that they can also build and create things, uh, well, they started to do geeky things as well. Well, the most important part of um, how a geek girl was formed was homeschooling. You know, homeschooling meant in the 19th and uh, 18th century that uh, parents, uh, well, hired tutors and professors to teach their daughters and sons at home because there was no public school and uh, if there was, it was, uh, wasn't obligatory to go there. Uh, homeschooling meant uh, different things for boys and girls. So, uh, homeschooling for girls mainly meant doing embroidery, singing, learning languages, and maybe some literature, but nothing scientific. For boys, homeschooling meant mathematics, physics, chemistry, and sciences in general when they were not separated. Um, for, for parents, it was mo more comfortable this way because uh, if a girl doesn't uh, know things about science, she won't be rebellious. Uh, she will be more convenient to the morals of, of, the, uh, of the age. Because um, people usually thought that uh, every new invention was a threat to morals. Uh, for example, when a girl r learns how to read or write, um, she can not only read love letters, but write an answer to it. And it was very dangerous. Uh, when the telephone was invented, um, well, you know, uh, th there used to be a woman who had to be with the lovers. She was called the guard of them. But we, uh, via the telephone, uh, they could talk privately. The lovers and it was also dangerous to morals because uh, they could manage to uh, see each other and arrange the, the rendezvous together. When the TV was invented, it uh, well, it was the source of an uncontrollable immorality because um, well, for for older girls and maybe sometimes for youngers, you couldn't just switch, switch it off, even though parents were a lot more straight back then. And the internet, well, the, everybody knows that the internet is for porn, so I don't think I have to uh, explain it. <laughs> and it was always the girls who were uh, prevented from um, uh, being scientists. There are really few examples, uh, even from the 19th and uh, 20th century. Just think about who has won the Nobel Prize. I mean, most people only <coughs> know Marie Curie and uh, her daughter, but not many more. Um, so, how was the geek girl born? Well, uh, girls were always related to telecommunication. It, it may sound curious because uh, most people just don't think of telecommunication as a girly thing. But uh, the telex machine, <coughs> the call centers and the telephone centers, and nowadays the help desks are uh, mostly operated by girls. Um, Mm, they have special talents to, to use this because they are much more patient than most men. They are they're said to be better at multitasking and they have a lot more empathy. Well, uh, one of my interviewees told me once that um, I have to care about the word empathy because empathy doesn't uh, mean that you are kind to people. It only means that you are able to listen to them. Because uh, even a sadist can be empathic because uh, they, they feel the, 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 the pain of the others. So empathy is only just the feeling how the others feel. And it has a, uh, all has a common root, the typewriter. And why the typewriter? Well, the typewriter was invented in the 18th century and the first prototypes uh, didn't really work out. Uh, so we had to wait more than 100 years to be, uh, for it to be mass produced. It was the Remington company uh, that started to make typewriters. And uh, by Remington, I mean the one that makes the, the guns, the firearms. 
uh, of course, um, they targeted men at the first time um, because they thought that, well, this is a machine and men are mostly more related to machines than girls. And it was a complete failure because um, men just felt that it's a heartless machine and it's easier to hire some secretary to write letters instead of them. But uh, Remington didn't give up on this uh, well machine and they found a new target, middle class women. Well, you may ask why middle class? Because uh, the poor ones didn't have enough money to, to buy one for themselves and uh, women who were rich didn't want to, to work. And it was scandalous because women started to work. Well, there are many pros and cons when you talk about women's working, and as you can see, the two columns are the same. I wrote the same things in it, uh, because uh, these are the, mo the, the core points of uh, someone's life. For example, you need a salary, you need money to, to live. And it's really good to have money, that, because you can spend it on what you want, and you can be independent. But it's a bad thing from the point uh, of a husband, for example, because he can be no longer in control of, uh, of his wife. And uh, enjoyment is very important when you work, because if you don't enjoy what you work, is, uh, it, uh, it will ruin your life. <coughs> and um, enjoyment can be bad, because if you enjoy what you work, uh, from the point of the husband again, uh, you will abandon, well, not necessarily abandon, but abandon your family and uh, not care as much about your children as you would normally do. Husbands on the con side, you have uh, already seen it, and husbands on the pro side means that uh, you can get a husband if you work. For example, you can marry your boss or a colleague or co-worker. It's really good for a girl who has never been in town, uh, but it's really dangerous for families who didn't want their uh, daughter to work. And uh, family on the con side means that uh, you uh, well they thought that uh, girls will abandon their family if they uh, work, and family means that you can get a husband and have a family, and you uh, because you will have salary you can buy the things they need. Well, um, to, to get a better understanding of how the typewriter changed the uh, the way how uh, women are seen. Uh, I have to talk about Marshall McLuhan. She's kind of the Foucault of the geek studies because you, because you can always add uh, just a pinch of McLuhan to practically everything. Mm, the extension theory means uh, that if you invent something, it will add to uh, a body function, uh, it will improve it, and you will lose something. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of a car, uh, when they invented it, it was an extension of the leg. Uh, because you could walk faster and you could uh, go longer distances. And uh, when the typewriter was invented, it was uh, an extension of the female hand, because you could write letters more easily, and uh, uh, it was a loss in the case that um, they lost their femininity. Um, because handwriting is feminine, and when you type, it just becomes a genderless thing. And very slowly, people started to accept it because they needed the secretaries. And it was, uh, um, well, some kind of uh, an upward mobility for women. Because the geek girl, uh, or the girl who knows how to operate technology, uh, was fashionable at the time. It has become fashionable because of advertisements. Uh, I don't know if any one of you watches the series Mad Men, but in that you can, you can see it. Because Peggy is uh, from a very poor family, and she came in town, and she, well, has, she has changed throughout the uh, four or five seasons. Uh, she was just a grey mouse, and now she is a very feminine and very attractive woman. And this new type of girl, the typewriter girl, is a mediator, because... Uh, she uses technology to transmit thoughts. Well, not necessarily her, her thoughts, but that was not a question at the time. She was modern because she used all the modern technologies and she was feminine and fashionable. As you can see on the small round image, well, that's, that's not a typewriter ad, that's a nail polish ad advertisement. And they ad advertised it with typewriter girls. And this new girl, <coughs> new technology. I always ask my interviewees, why is it trendy to become a geek and 
is it at all? And they always said that, yes, it is. Why? Because geeks are considered to be people who know more about the rules of today's life than the mainstream user populace. They are considered to be closer to makers. Mm, from this, uh, the most important part is that they know more, more about the rules of today's life. Um, because uh, for everybody, and it's not only for women, uh, knowing how the world works is, uh, is a very big advantage. And geekers are sexy because they know how things work. Uh, now we will talk a little bit, bit, little bit about uh, stereotypes and the re reality. Uh, I don't know if you have a stereotypic geek girl in your thoughts, but uh, geek girls are usually, usually the ones who exchange social behavior for amassing knowledge. Um, this practically means that they are unfriendly and uh, they only care about what they do. And at this point, I would like to note that um, a geek can be anyone, not only a girl who is in science, but who is interested in anything. So uh, I follow makeup geeks, craft geeks, and uh, a lot of geeks, but mostly now I will talk about technology. Uh, geekers are feminists um, because um, there are so many men. For example, yesterday I counted here only 10 women, <coughs> except for the hostesses, and today maximum 20. So they have to be feminist in order to protect themselves. And uh, we think that geek girls are tomboys, which means that when they are small, uh, they mostly play with boyish things and they, they look like uh, small boys. Uh, for example, when I, I ask my interviewees what they mostly played with when they were uh, small, they usually played with their uh, daddy's tools, uh, saws, and they used to do the lawn mowing and everything, and mm, hardly any one of them or just a few had dolls. And it's very funny that we still attach girly, li girly labels to geek girls. For example, uh, there's a hackerspace in Wien, uh, and in Vienna, and when I asked the, the, uh, the geek girls there, uh, they told me that, well, we have to do the cooking, we have a sewing circle, and we mostly do the cleaning at the place. And it's very funny because even boys could do the, could do the cleaning because uh, I don't think it, the, that place could be that big. Mm. And so this means that uh, they still have the traditional place in the family, which is kind of a good thing. And uh, we mainly think that geek girls are ugly. And I, don't laugh, please. <laughs> so, um, and I should say that geek girls are not ugly. Um, they just um, use, don't use as much as time, as much from their time as a uh, um, normal girl to be extremely pretty. But I think they can be pretty. Um, this is what you, uh, usually the well, the books call the ugly duckling. Uh, well, not, it's not a phenomenon, but it's a kind of um, because when geek girls ha uh, just you meet one in everyday life. They look like a normal woman. And when they have to, for example, go to a party or anything, they can be bad. Uh, bad? Oh, well dressed, sorry. <laughs> and um, geekers, well, we usually say that they are not so well dressed, but it's just because have you ever seen what a uh, um, t shirt store like, uh, oh, what's its name? I forgot it. Never mind. Any kind of geek t shirt store. <laughs> Just think one, you know. Um, they mainly sell uh, t-shirts in men sizes only. And if, even if they have girly ones, they look so plain. They are just black, mainly black. They sometimes have a pink one or dark blue. So if you want to uh, express your geeky feelings, you just don't have the, the means for it. And it's, uh, it's very funny because it could be a um, kind of a niche in marketing because if you produce the geeky t-shirts for geek girls uh, that ac actually look feminine, I think they would wear it. Uh, even maternity t-shirts look like, uh, like men's t-shirts. So it, uh, it's, it's really funny. And um, I wanted to say something. Oh. <laughs> no, I forgot it. So the real geek girls, uh, when I, uh, 
Well, most interviews start that, hello, I'm Judith, and uh, please tell me something about your geeky life. And they always say that, no way, I'm not a geek. And well, if you meet someone who spends uh, her days at a laboratory or making computer programs or uh, hacking something, well, I think that's what we usually call a geek. And uh, maybe this, um, this is the feeling of not belonging there, because uh, most, uh, when I ask them why, why they don't feel themselves geeky, they usually say that uh, because most of their colleagues spend uh, more time uh, with hacking or at the laboratory or everything. So they don't feel that they belong there because they don't, uh, don't spend enough time there. Mm, and I think this could be changed very easily if uh, men understood that girls don't really have, I mean, they could spare the, the, the tasks at home or things like that. Uh, a real geek girl socializes, so they don't exchange social behavior. Uh, they are just picky. For example, they don't like those who uh, think that they are menial than them because they are just normal people and they want to socialize with uh, people who are similar. Um, and it's re and not, re not very easy for them to find similar people um, because they are uh, ex uh, outside the university because they are, well, in Hungary, I don't think there is any uh, gig girl uh, organization mm, abroad. Uh, I have heard of some, for example, there is geekgirls.org or geek girl dinners. Uh, which latest one is very interesting because they organize monthly dinners for geek girls only. Um, and it's kind of like a meetup. I don't know if you know that. Um, and that's why geek girls have to choose between being girly or being a geek. And this is what I call the Jackie or Hyde problem because uh, this means that um, geek girls um, can be geeks when they are at the laboratory or with the, that few geek, geek friends they have. They can play, uh, for example, Halo or World of Warcraft together. But uh, mm, otherwise, they, they simply must find normal friends. And normal friends take up time. I mean, I, I have some. I, I don't say that it's bad to have normal friends, but uh, it's usually just easy to have only geek friends. Because um, there was a university case study where they were asking geek girls uh, why they felt that they didn't belong to the university community. And uh, most of them said that uh, um, it was because uh, boys from a very early age were allowed to uh, play with the computer and uh, spend their time in front of it. And their mothers didn't really tell them to stop it or to do the household chores or to go to violin class or singing class or anything like that. But for, for girls, it's, uh, well, it's a social convention. Uh, when a girl wants to play the computer all the day, um, it's, it's weird, yeah, even for the parents. And there are only some parents who think that this can be useful in the future. For example, there was um, the, the dean of the Harvard University um, and it was very scandalous because he, he was telling a story about their daughters. Uh, he had two, and uh, he gave them little trucks, two trucks. And um, they play together, and they tell their dad that, hey, daddy, look, the, the daddy truck is carrying the baby truck. And uh, he had uh, the, the results that, oh, yeah, my girls are not capable of thinking in a technical way of technical things. And I think this was, well, from a feminist point of view, this was very um, undermining their, an undermining of their being a human. And geekers are mostly feminists, as I've told, because they have to protect themselves from, from men. Well, as I study communication, I uh, choose to analyze uh, geeks on TV, mostly sitcoms, because this was the only uh, field what uh, both geeks and non-geeks watched. Mm, and I don't know if you, uh, how, how much of you watch TV or any kind of series regularly, but there was a change uh, throughout the years. For example, in the 1960s and 1970s, <coughs> when, um, when in the TV series any kind of girl with science was shown, uh, they were mostly the ones who had no social lives and who looked like boys. Then there was a phenomenon for uh, 
girls for geeks. For example, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, she was not a geek, but she was for geeks because mostly geeks watched it. And um, today uh, we can see actual geek girls on TV who sometimes turn out to be feminine. For example, uh, in the NCIS or Dr. Bone or, or the, Big Bang the uh, Big Bang Theory, you can see actual geek girls. And TV is a really good uh, thing to, to examine because uh, it creates a parallel universe. What you see on TV is the mirror of the real life, but on TV you can exaggerate. And, um, and TV series usually pick up uh, what in the mainstream is. And uh, as we can see, geek is the new chic. Because, uh, yeah, I've shown that slide before, that geek is, uh, geek is really trendy nowadays because they, they know how the world works. And geek girls on these TV shows are mostly shown with sexist vibes. And by this I mean that they usually get comments that even in real life would be very harassing. Uh, for my analysis I chose the Big Bang Theory. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, because this, uh, this is one of the series that most of my uh, interviewees watch, so they can, they can make an um, analog analogy <laughs> with themselves and the geeks in this series. And uh, <coughs> um, in this, there are two uh, main female characters, Bernadette and Amy Farrow Fowler. And these girls, uh, Bernadette is the blondie and uh, Amy is the brown one. So these girls are not only uh, scientists who spend most of the days in a laboratory and they even have doctorates, but also very feminine and very friendly. So I will talk about Amy Fairfowler mostly. Uh, she's a neurobiologist who used to be very introverted. She wasn't interested in men, she didn't even know what love means or feeling love. Um, and uh, then she got into this group of geeks suddenly. I don't know if any one of you, how many of you watches this series? Okay, most of you, great. <laughs> so um, she had to be explained how love works. Uh, do you remember when she was standing, anyone, went, anytime when she saw Zach? No, no, <laughs> uh, and um, well, before she got to know Sheldon, she had only spent time with her electric toothbrush called Jared. So, yeah, she didn't, know, uh, she didn't really know anything about it. And uh, she, she hasn't been in between girls before. Uh, it, turned out, it turned out that she has never been to a slumber party, she never played with geek girls, and, um, or any girls, and she was always bullied at school. And uh, when she got into this group of girls, she became super girly. For example, she wanted to get a tiara and a pink, pink dress, and she went to this sleepover. And now I would like to show a little animated GIF about uh, this tiara thing, because it was really cute. So I don't think you would expect a geek girl to react anything to like anything to it like like this. So she is beautiful. She's a princess, and she even kissed Sheldon. So yeah. And why is it good to see all this on TV? Well, this is the most objective part of my presentation, but this makes the nerd girls legitimate. And uh, this fight against the traditional image of the nerd girl, which means that uh, they are usually thought to be ugly, but I don't think Amy is beautiful, but she's not as ugly as most girls on t uh, some girls on TV, so she's quite okay. <laughs> and uh, as it is making fun of geek girls, it brings them closer. And uh, this is a kind of a new role model for, for girls, because before, um, the only thing they could see on TV is that if you wear high boots and you paint your hair black, hair black and wear uh, thick glasses, you will become a geek girl or the traditional geek girl. And um, this is particularly important because uh, if you know Bernadette, she is blonde, she's got long hair and she's really beautiful and she's a geek girl because she, she, uses, uh, she usually uh, talks about science when she has to make a comparison. And um, this is finally a postgrad woman who does know what to do with her life. 
For example, this is not, uh, this is no Sex and the City or anything like this with a single woman, but they are a uh, really feminine woman who actually married, well, she married Howard, as you know. And we really need, need it because there is a, a phenomenon we call the leaky pipeline phenomenon. There are four uh, critical per uh, periods in a girl's life that uh, make um, the retention of women in science. Uh, but I think first, first I have to e explain the leaky pipeline itself. <laughs> Just imagine that you have a resource of something uh, coming to you through a pipeline. And uh, if the pipeline has leaks, you will lose some of your resources. And uh, in, in the case of girls, uh, we can see that there is approximately, well, 60 or 70 percent of girls who enter uh, technology universities or technology related uh, mm, high schools and when we try to get numbers of girls in science it decreases to about 30 or 40 percent which is really low I mean one third of people working in the scientific fields are women only so we have to care of their early childhood adolescence college and graduates graduate school and job entry period period <laughs> Because uh, throughout these years, the things that change are the self-esteem and the job performance. For example, uh, little girls are very achieving. They want to be good at school, they want to get good grades. And if um, they don't have teachers who support them, they will lose interest. And uh, most of the geek girls lose interest in their field because they, they don't get enough feedback from their teachers and their parents. That's why they need advisors or mentors. And uh, there are some solutions that could be made for geek girls to, to be better performing. For example, uh, you can make role models for them, like on TV or actual ones. But this can be dangerous because it sounds really good that, uh, well, here's a woman who has achieved something and uh, she will carry on with her life like this and this. But if you only communicate that they have this possibility, they won't know uh, how to get there. And, uh, they don't always have enough, uh, well, support to get to the point when they can be uh, actually successful. Because it, uh, it's harder for a girl to, to be successful at school. For example, you don't have to, you, I mean, you're allowed to, but you don't really have to communicate the idea of only becoming a neuroscientist. But you have to communicate to them that for that, you don't have to give up, give up on your dreams uh, of uh, Mm, overachieving in chemistry and physics, or, and biology, of course. Other solutions that are much more effective is uh, offering more possibilities uh, for girls at high school and uh, involving girls in projects. Mm, for example, there was a project called Girls Creating Games, where girls were actually um, asked to create programs in, in real programming languages, like C or C++, um, because that was, I think, the easiest to explain. And uh, they had something tangible at the end. They, they, went through a prog uh, they went through a period of, well, actually making the program, documenting it, and um, making a product out of it at the age of 12. And, well, I, I usually don't think many girls know how to program in C++ at the age of 12, but um, they just got this as a possibility, as a part-time part -time job after school, and um, it turned out that they enjoy it. And they need, it, uh, it was only one company that did it, and they could organize it for, uh, like, I think there were five high schools involved in it. And we have to get rid of st uh, stereotypes, and uh, in parallel, we ha have to encourage these girls actively. And um, for the companies, we need a much stronger CSR, which means the corporate social responsibility. And... Um, well, there are many companies that organize things like this. For example, there is a, a beautician company that makes, uh, I think it's a prize for women who excel in sciences. And, uh, well, some of the telecommunication companies has the same one. And these are really good because if you have a, well, girls need goals. Uh, because they, girls tend to focus on how they achieve it, but if they have practical goals, um, it will be easier to organize their, their way towards it. And they feel like that they are working for something important. 
and we would need much more community spaces where they can gather and uh, socialize with similar people. And I've written other outcasts because um, most people who gather at these spaces are considered to be outcasts for society. And for example, there, uh, you can go to a hackerspace or an after-school science lab where uh, you can socialize and improve your skills. Because as I have mentioned, mentioned before, um, girls who need girly friends, they will lose time. And if you lose time, you will, you, uh, you will lose girls who could be in science. So that's what I wanted, all I wanted to say, and thanks for your attention.